Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Watch podcast series. I'm John Briggs, Global Head of Debt Strategy. This series helps you cut through the noise of global financial markets with a quick take on the upcoming trends to watch. Thank you for joining me this week, a week after a holiday for me, and in which I'm grateful for Giles Gale and covering for me last week. When I last spoke to you two weeks ago, I expressed the feeling that I was getting a bit more optimistic on markets, but we just needed to get through last week where the Fed and Bank of England meetings occurred without seeing more disruptive yield increases. If we got through that, felt like we could be more comfortable with the outlook for riskier assets and look for less volatile markets in general. I don't know if it was just the week of the fresh mountain air or just getting through those actual events, but I'm definitely feeling more optimistic and feel the disruptive rise in government bond yields is for the most part behind us. And that doesn't mean that we're not gonna see yields continue to rise. In fact, we do feel like the path of least resistance for yields over the medium term in the US, UK and Europe is for yields to trickle higher. But I'm thinking of the days of volatile, disruptive rises in yields that negatively impact other asset classes. I think that for now, hopefully those should be generally in the past. The story is not over, but I think we've bought some time. So as we're scaling back on some of our broad bearishness across US, European, and UK rates, this leads to a more optimistic outlook on risk assets. This doesn't mean that we return though to the same conditions we had in January when we had the reflation theme in full effect and that was good for everything. You know, Yields were rising, but that was a sign of optimism in the growth and inflation outlook. EM in general was rallying, equities were trading well, credit was trading well, it was basically good for everything. This time, I think we can still probably generalize that credit and equities are in good shape, although I think we'll continue to see that rotation to the value and reopening stocks versus perhaps, you know, the tech and growth and stay at home stocks. Um, in general, the, the market's probably in good shape. When you look at currencies and commodities, I think you need to be more selective. For example, the US and the UK, as we all know, are clearly the leaders in vaccination and fiscal policy. Is this good for the dollar or bad for the dollar? Well, in January, the reflation theme was a general dollar negative. Now it's more nuanced. For example, we think against other low yielding currencies like yen and Swiss, it's probably good for the dollar. But against other higher yielding currencies, especially those that are tied to the oil and the commodity outlook, Canada, Norway, um, Australia on the, on the industrial commodity side, and Colombia, it's probably a dollar weakener as those um, countries attack, attract capital. So it's much more selective. As I said, we tend to favor oil linked assets a bit more at the moment, ESG issues aside, than other commodity producers as the US and UK, more service based economies expand, more fuels, fuel guzzling planes get in the air, uh, cars and trucks on the road, things reopen, probably should benefit those, those commodities and those currencies. But also, as I mentioned, one particular area we need to differentiate is within EM. Um, to start the year, you could be positive on the asset class more generally. And indeed, we were particularly positive on EM Asia as a broad theme, but now you need to be much more selective. To explore this further, I'm now gonna bring in our special guest for the week, which is our, who is our emerging market strategist, Galvin Chia. All right, so Galvin, let's just kick off right away. You heard what I just went through. What are your what are your thoughts on it in generally? Do you think that the selectivity argument is holds for EM, or do you think that the asset class more broadly should just be fine? Hey, John. Yeah, I think the selectivity definitely is key right now, and emerging markets as a whole are at a juncture of a couple of different forces right now. So, from the thirty thousand foot perspective, risk markets are still settling after some pretty volatile moves in the U.S. Treasury market, and whilst uh, there are still concerns around a bond market. Uh, a bond market t tantrum, that is, as you mentioned, is definitely still something to keep an eye out for as a driver of asset price movements uh, globally. The, the dollar index has overall been a strong performer this year. And as we start to think about where the US will lead in the global race to recovery and growth, this could also figure capital allocation to the US over the emerging markets. And one factor that highlights the need for being selective in the return uh, is the return of political gyrations in local markets. I'll give you two examples from what that's felt like, from what's felt like basically a a really, really long week. So the first is Russia. Right? Russia, uh, Russian assets like the currency and bond markets have been under stress, uh, and markets are pretty worried about the potential sanctions from countries like the US, and particularly any impact that these sanctions may have on the Russian financial system and the ability to transact these assets internationally. So we think that the muddying uh, in this external geopolitical outlook has actually contributed uh, to the Russian central bank raising interest rates last week, which was pretty much unexpected uh, by a lot of uh, the economists uh, in the market. So our view is that the Russian ruble does have scope to appreciate on the basis of strong oil prices 
and over the six to nine month horizon, as you mentioned on the sort of global reopening and reflation theme, but in the shorter term, a lot of this political uncertainty might result uh, in some choppiness in the asset. Uh, secondly, the, the other sort of one that's caught a lot of the market's attention uh, over the course of the weekend uh, and this week uh, has been Turkey. So last weekend, the central bank governor was actually dismissed and, and just a sort of just mere two days after they raised interest rates uh, by a very large two, whole, uh, two percentage points. Uh, this was a huge surprise and caused a bit of a storm, to say the least. Uh, while interest rates there are among the highest in the world right now at 19%, inflation is also really high at about 15% and rising. So what investors uh, are really worried about there is whether this new governor will start talking about cutting interest rates faster to potentially stimulate the economy, but which will also risk further inflation and capital outflows as well. So while high interest rates and high carry mean uh, that you know, this may keep a lid on some of the currency weakness for now, uh, over the coming weeks, investor might, investors might really be looking forward, I'm uh, sorry, looking for signals rather, that the central bank is going to be able to deliver a stable policy, uh, hold high interest rates, and really be committed to fighting inflation. So what's interesting there is that the contrast between those two. So while the Russian central bank has really been leaning against the external political worries by raising interest rates, and making sure that expectations for things like inflation are contained and orderly, the Turkish central bank has unfortunately been caught up in the center uh, of local politics. So, yeah, very tricky on that when politics get involved, especially in emerging markets. So, um, okay, so you've gone through Turkey, you've gone through Russia. What, what are some of the cases that you think you're more optimistic on or anything in particular that investors should avoid? Yeah, so I think there are definitely causes to be a bit, uh, to be more optimistic. But as you mentioned sort of earlier, it's a little bit harder than to than to be able to throw a dart at the dartboard and sort of pick up something in the emerging markets and, and make uh, make money off of it. Right? So so we've identified a couple of uh, big picture sort of uh, driving forces for optimism in the emerging market asset class, uh, and and and. You know, some of these assets, some of these countries still remain uh, supported uh, by these factors. So, in roughly in order of what we've been thinking about lately as the most compelling forces in play right now, you've mentioned commodities, and we think commodities are definitely one of the big supports uh, for emerging market, and particularly crude oil, as you mentioned. So, so there we think that the currencies like the Colombian peso, Russian ruble, uh, could benefit from higher oil prices in their oil dependent economies, uh, while on the converse, the Indian rupee uh, could suffer as capital flows out of the country to pay for large oil imports. So actually, on that fact, you know, they're, they're one of the largest uh, oil importers uh, in the world. Um, growth, vaccines, and central bank interest rates that are projected to move higher, that's another theme that we're definitely thinking about uh, as well, you know, as the world starts to come out of its COVID-induced slump and as we start to think more about how vaccines are going to be distributed in the order and the way in which economies are going to reopen, uh, you know, we think that the Brazilian real could actually do well uh, on, on some of those fronts, particularly on the central bank and inflation nexus, uh, as there the uh, inflation has been, has been pretty high and the central bank there ha hiked interest rates uh, last week. From the economic standpoint, the economies of Israel, Chile, South Korea, and India, we think could be could be taking the lead on the vaccine front uh, and, and on the return to growth side as well. So the third factor there we think is, is, is on, on the idea around trade flows, right? So trade flows should still be strong as countries with strong, strong consumer spending uh, like the US and the UK recover quickly and as demand there for things like uh, commodities, industrial goods, as well as consumer goods picks up. Uh, this could continue to benefit for now the current accounts of commodity exporters like Russia, South Africa, as well as manufactured goods, uh, manufactured good exporters rather, like China and Taiwan. Thanks, Galvin. That was that was super thorough and very informative. So, as a whole, as we wrap up here, definitely getting more optimistic. Be a little more selective for your commodities and EM. Obviously, there's a linked theme there. Um, more positive in risk assets, as long as this what we're seeing is some starting. We're starting to see some stabling, stabilizing in, in rate markets, which we think will continue. We do see higher yields over time, but you know this lower volatility should lead to greater risk appetites and um, a better risk environment. So thanks everybody for joining us this week. Talk to you soon. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of The Weekly Watch. Please subscribe to our channel to get future episodes. We also encourage you to explore more of our content on our website and other social media channels.